I'm Ethan Allen, your host of Likeable Science. Welcome to another episode. This is a special episode of Likeable Science because it's really likeable engineering. <laughs> and that almost sounds like a, a paradox to some folks, but <laughs> I, I hope we'll convince you here that, that likeable engineering is really where, where it's at now. With me today is uh, Dr. Song Choi, the Assistant Dean for Engineering at, the, at UH Manoa. Welcome. How are you doing? Good, good to see you. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is something that people, a lot of people don't think much of engineering or don't, okay. they're sort of scared of engineering, okay. but, but you obviously found it very attractive. What is it that sort of brought you into engineering? How did you get here? What brings you <laughs> into work every day? I, I think most people go into engineering because they have a sense of creation oh. and they want to make something uh, like an iPhone or an electric bike as we were talking about earlier. Some sort of a innovation gadget, the creativity aspect. You know, so, so I, I think maybe like you know we were talking about earlier, um, there has to be an explanation about what engineering is. Um, I think most people think of engineering as one of the sciences or math. Right. It, very it dry. actually isn't. Right. It actually isn't because if you think about what engineering means. Engineering is the application of what you learn in science and mathematics. Right, it's right? solving the problems, That's actual right. human problems. That's right, so to me, science is the study of everything that's happened, so we can come out with the rules, the laws, the physical and you know, aspects that we can't change. Mm -hmm. I think engineering is taking that and creating something like that cell phone that we thought we saw when we watched Star Trek back in the <laughs> 60s, or, uh, or, 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 or the flying cars, or the drones, right? right? Where who would have thought that we could have our own private little helicopters and watch <laughs> other people? I mean, it's incredible. But these things have happened probably because we have a lot of dreamers and uh, all these dreamers are, uh, have a good understanding of the science and the mathematics, and they're making things. Well, now, that's, that's interesting that you, that you talk about it as, as a creative mm -hmm. field, when uh, I think it's, it's widely perceived as being sort of a, a cut and dry, mm -hmm. ra rather mm -hmm. dull, almost tedious mm -hmm. kind, kind of field of study, mm -hmm. filled with mathematical equations mm -hmm. and formulas to figure out the mm -hmm. stresses on things. Mm -hmm. But you're sort of saying it's driven by this, this underlying creative force, this, this urge on people's part to make people's lives better, to solve some challenge, overcome some challenge, or solve a problem. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I mean, if you think about many of the things that we do in life, uh, the first time might be a really exciting, interesting aspect, but as things become more routine, they become mundane. Mm -hmm. So, and I apologize to all the doctors out there, but <laughs> If you were to do an appendectomy three or four times a day, I would assume that an appendectomy is about as dry as you can get. <laughs> Simple cut, take out, and you can go home. <laughs> and now with the advent of all these robot surgery, mm -hmm. there is virtually no recovery time. They stick a probe into a place where you already have a, a hole, like your belly button, uh -huh. go in there, grab it, cauterize it so you don't have to do this cut and stitch. Stick in a little plastic bag, like a little doggy bag, pull it out, throw it away, and you can go yeah. home. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I, I think, I, I think the uh, the dryness mm -hmm. is wherever you see it being made that way. Uh, even creative aspects. I think if somebody was doing art or music, and their art or music was uh, somehow limited in the way they could broaden their ex expression or emotions, right? That's pretty cut and dry. I mean, right. making cards every day? <laughs> right, if you were told you had to paint a portrait every day mm -hmm. of your life, after, yeah. after some thousands of portraits, you're probably going to get pretty tired of it. Yeah, you're going to want to do something different. Yeah. So I, I believe that's the same thing. Yeah, but uh, I think what's, what, what's not appreciated mm -hmm. is sort of how engineering really infiltrates every aspect of our life. I mean, literally, much of the food we eat yep. would, not, would not be here if it were not for mm -hmm. engineering, for several mm -hmm. kinds of engineering, mm -hmm. everything from the processing of the grains mm -hmm. to the packaging of the food to the shipping. I agree. Uh, you know, the clothing we wear, mm -hmm. the cars we drive, mm -hmm. the buildings, we, mm -hmm. the, the paint on the walls, mm -hmm. everything is, if it's not sort of a 
product uh, of nature designed by and, and pr produced in a natural manner mm -hmm. by plants or animals, almost everything else that's left is an engineering product, yeah. basically. <laughs> in, a, in a way. Uh, you, know, you, uh, you bring up an interesting point because people look at engineers and when we talk about design, they think we're designing a product. Right. But engineering is also the designing of a process. Right. So, as you said, the food process. To make the food process more efficient, if we use engineering to gather the seeds, plant the seeds, water the seeds, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and even to harvest the seeds, it's, it's, it's you, the... You can, <coughs> yeah, the whole, the whole productivity mm -hmm. goes up immensely. You know, you, you, you can design machines that will do these things much, much, much more efficiently That's than right. people ever could. And it can do right. things that people can't do. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my uh, folks who I knew back at University of Washington designed a cell sorter mm -hmm. that would take liquids that had cell suspensions in them, shoot individual droplets at about 4,000 droplets per second past a detector, and could pull out individual droplets out of that stream, and which had certain, certain genes <coughs> that were marked. Excuse me. And, you know, I mean, no, nobody could do that. You couldn't sort, I, you know, neither you nor I could sort 4,000 mm -hmm. droplets a second, you know, if our lives depended on it. You know. I, I think one of the most interesting videos I saw was the uh, MIT shooting of a bullet through an apple, mm -hmm. or the water droplet with uh, very high-speed cameras. Right. Edgerton yep. photography. That's right. right. So the uh, actual visualization of the physics and the math in play Let's just understand the, in, in a way, the tediousness that's required mm -hmm. to um, make those things happen. Mm -hmm. And I think from that, when we come back to like this thing about the food processing, think about how expensive food would be if people did everything from peeling that little seed and planting it and then harvesting it, cutting it out and cleaning it up, right. and then selling it and then of course, transporting it, maybe they're walking it or pulling it in a, in a buggy. Right. That's a pretty expensive lettuce, right? Right, or if you, if you had to sort of produce all your mm -hmm. own food yourself, mm -hmm. I mean, you would spend huge amounts of your time doing it. That's Instead, right. we'd stop by the store, grab what we need, and five minutes That's right. out. Boom, That's right. You know? And yeah, so then we can heat it and cook it thoroughly in a matter of a few moments in a microwave yeah. now, typically. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think we forget that um, uh, because of the advent of development of engineering, we're able to afford so many things that uh, maybe maybe some of the younger people do not understand and know. Um, uh, you probably well as I do. Um, you know, I, I was a little young to buy a car in the '60s, but I remember my father having a car and how expensive the car was because they were literally handmade. Um, I, I look at the cars now. Yes, they're ex more expensive dollar wise than uh, what it was in the 60s, but if I look at the actual percentage based on people's salaries, it hasn't gone up. Or to, to use an even more extreme example, computer mm -hmm. technology has dropped so dramatically. That's right. Computers used to be very expensive. That's right. Now you have so much computing power in a phone that you can buy for a couple hundred bucks that it's just astounding. No, it, yeah. It's very astounding. Uh, uh, people. If, if, if they're not old enough, they should think about the fact that in 19, late 1960s, uh, we put the man on the moon and the computer we used was so slow and so low in memory that it, it would be like one thousandth the time, uh, power of your cell phone, your right. smartphone. Yeah. And at the same time, it's probably like one millionth the size of, of the of the actual computer that put people on the moon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, were, they were houses. They weren't, they weren't yeah. something you held. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, I remember that. There were big, big, you know, big computer rooms filled with... That's right. Machines. Yeah, That's right. But people also don't understand, I think, or they forget that technology is well beyond that. That is, just a piece of, pa a piece of paper is a product of technology. That's right. Uh, the machine that printed the mm -hmm. print on the paper, mm -hmm. the, the inks mm -hmm. are, are products of technology. Mm -hmm. all, all this People had to figure this stuff out, and mm -hmm. technology has really now grown. I think people uh, naively consider it 
sort of building bridges is a classic. That's a that, that's an mm. engineering kind of feat. Okay, you know? okay. That's sort of yeah, what yeah. an engineer yes, is doing. Yes, you know, yes, something yes. like building big structures. Yes, yes. And that's that's one civil engineering is one field, right? But a very big field. Yes. But but you know the, the, the thing on the front page of the Pacific Business News today is, is uh, the new uh, Hawaii's boutique booze business. Mm -hmm. And there's you know high level chemical engineering involved right. in, in ma making those mixes mm -hmm. that are taste good that have the right kinds. Mm -hmm. of, uh, flavors, the right kinds of odors, the right kinds of color, um, are not toxic. <laughs> uh, and then much less the whole manufacturing process that involves a lot of different kinds of engineering from the bottles to the caps to the assembly lines to getting, getting them, you know, moved around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, you know, Ethan, that my background is mechanical engineering. Right. I do controls, dynamics. I, I work with robots. Right. And a process line that makes booze, beer, mm -hmm is in, in essence a, a robot because right. you are sitting there making sure with sensors, testing to make sure they don't overflow, they control the taste and the aroma and everything else. Uh, we are in a society where technology, as you said, is embedded in our life more so than you could ever imagine. Yes, it's very, very hard to envision sort of Getting away from technology, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't, you sort of can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. huh? At least not, not in our culture, really. It's, it's. Yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't know how to turn on a phone if I didn't have a remote control anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, a, a TV. Because I, because I, I really don't. I mean, the reason the phone came up is, uh, I realized my nephews don't even have a remote control. They use their phone to turn on the TV. Oh, really? So yeah, they have applications for everything. Uh, they know how to, apparently, get around how to do everything. So. Yeah. We, we live in an interesting world. So, so that, that gets us into this whole thing. It, it's, it's National Engineers Week. Mm -hmm. Engineering, we've just established, is a really critical field <coughs> that, that has huge impacts on everyone's life. Mm -hmm. So the education of engineers is clearly a very important business, and mm -hmm. this, is, this is what you do, right? Yes. I mean, you, you are very deeply involved yes. in, in education of engineers. Mm -hmm. And that's one that's got to have changed a whole lot, both the incoming students and, and their talents and their interests but two of the expectations as they leave your program mm -hmm. of what they're going to go off and do have mm -hmm. also changed mm -hmm. a lot. So uh, you, you've got a bunch of interesting looking programs from your iLab, your manufacturing center, your mm -hmm. fab lab. Mm -hmm. uh, tell, tell us about, a little well, bit about some of those. Well, in, in a way, those things that you mentioned, the iLab, the fab lab, fab lab manufacturing, they're all very closely related. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're trying to make students obviously understand the uh, the basic fundamentals of engineering, whether it's mechanical, civil, electrical, uh, and you can go even beyond and go deeper into that, biomedical, uh, aerospace, but the fundamentals are the same. And once they know that, we need them to be innovative, mm -hmm. creative. And you know, part of the tie-in with the innovation and the creativity are things like entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people get to have the misconception, the misunderstanding that you can't be entrepreneurial within a large corporation. And I think that's wrong. Oh, yeah, you have to be. Yes, you have to be because large corporations survive on new products. Right. That means somebody has to be entrepreneurial enough right. to come up with that innovative product. Exactly that process. They, mm -hmm. they look and they say, why are we going A, B, C, D when we can go from A to D directly? And mm -hmm. we can just skip B and C and drop two, that, two that other is steps exactly out of the right. process. That is exactly right. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, it, we have one of the biggest uh, employers in the world, and that is the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And people think the U.S. military is this archaic engineering machine that needs like a crank to get started and run. But if you really think about it, if it is a crank and uh, thing to start and run, that is where we should be going in more to, to make those things much more efficient. And that is innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And that is utilizing all the fundamental physics and mathematics to create that change that can uh, exist uh, for the long run. Super. We're going to follow, follow this up and talk about how engineering relates to other fields here in sure. just a moment. But we're going to first take a brief break. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, your host of Likeable Science, here with Song Choi, the Assistant Dean of Engineering at the College of Engineering uh, at UH Manoa. And we'll be right back after a break. Aloha! Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests.
Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech. Wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Good afternoon. You're back here on Likeable Engineering today with Ethan Allen, your host, and Salam Choi from UH Manoa, Assistant Dean of Engineering. We're talking about engineering and the relationship of engineering to science and how the education process ties into all this. It's, it's intriguing one to, to note here as we get into this that the new next generation science standards mm -hmm. for the first time basically are standards that really explicitly incorporate engineering in, into science learning. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that the intimate nature of, of the linkage in, in terms of practices of science and the practices of engineering are very similar. The same big cross-cutting idea, size and scale, constancy and change, all mm -hmm. these things uh, talk, uh, deal in pure physics, but they, they deal in applications too. You have, to, you have to know how to scale stuff up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, we are always doing things at a smaller scale, and we need to figure out how we can size those, scale those up to make sure they can work in the real world. Uh, as you know, because you've sat in many of these meetings with me, uh, with the Department of Education and all that, the NGSS really is <clears throat> not making any different changes. It's basically saying that the process in experimentation in science and the process of creating in engineering the design process it's not much different. It, a lot of it has to do with repetition and persistence. Right. And those are two characteristics that you need to do and be successful in anything. Right. You know, you, you can't just try once and say, oh, doesn't work, right. let's go. Right. You know, you have to keep trying and trying and then you're going to come up with new answers and the new answers are going to give you insights in a new path. Mm -hmm. That's to me, where the innovation and the creativity comes in. Right, yeah. When you combine, combine those characteristics with skepticism mm -hmm. and curiosity, you, re you really have a winning combination. That's there, right. right? That's know, right. Some, somebody who know, knows enough to ask the questions mm -hmm. is observant enough to say, this is a very funny result. That's right. And, and what, what, what does this mean? Why did it come up this way? What did I do differently? You know? Well, you know, that, that, I want to make a comment about that sure. because um, we've computerized so many things mm -hmm. that we expect the softwares that we run to spit out the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems that we run into that into with that is if a, a student or a novice in engineering or science really have no idea where the magnitude of their answer needs to fit, mm -hmm. how are they going to know if the answer is actually valid? That's right. You don't. Right. So, so the uh, the necessity in going through the rigor of solving problems by hand mm -hmm. and understanding the process by which you solve problems is extremely important. Right. It, and, it, and having that having that idea, at least mm -hmm. some ballpark of where your mm -hmm. where your answer should end up. hundred percent. So so my wife and I were were a while ago mm -hmm. talking about doing some budget projecting mm -hmm. for our incomes and all. My wife ends up and smiled at me and said, oh, look, we're going to have $10 billion at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> a couple right. zeros off, I think, but uh, that's, right. that, that, that's a good, uh, good thought right. to have. Yeah. Right? It looked real good for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> but we knew we, that, wasn't, that wasn't in the ballpark. Yeah. You know, that, 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 there was obviously something wrong there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's right. And if, if you don't have any sense of that, yeah, you, you, yeah. Can, you can be led astray very, very radically. Yeah. I think uh, the, the, the diligence part that you're talking about and some of the dryness in engineering, may come from that because if an engineer, civil engineer, structural engineer was putting up a building, mm -hmm. I would hope that they have the diligence and the persistence to make sure that they verify the results they got from a computer program. Right. I hope they don't just take it randomly and say, oh, that's right. 
Right. You know, they, I think there has to be some uh, checks and balances. Sure, yeah, and you would hope they, you know, check the composition of the cement and, mm -hmm. and check to see if the blocks are mm -hmm. actually reasonably strong and that the mm -hmm. rebar is, is indeed that, that, you know, that, as advertised. And, and, you know, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and when you don't do that kind of thing, you see big problems happen in engineering and big mistakes happen in engineering and, and buildings fall down. That, that is correct. Engineering wasn't done right. I, 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 well, that's probably one of the reasons why they have so many standards on what materials have to be or minimum standards that they have to adhere to. Because right. I, I would hate to see rebar that getting put in that's half the strength of what it's supposed to be. Right. Well, and of course, it varies a lot. Here, I, I understand, for instance, in the islands, your rebar will tend to rust. Yes, it will. If, if it's not mm -hmm. the right kind of that's rebar. Right. And once it rusts, it, it's then expanding. It puts pressure mm -hmm. on the cement around it. That that's tracks right. the cement. That lets more moisture in and it rusts more. And that's right. pretty soon, the whole system is sort of headed towards a failure that, mode. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so uh, one of the uh, uh, common problems that happen when you have so, uh, so many uh, high-rise buildings is that uh, people tend to think that if you are dealing with water, that you can put a pipe from the first floor to the 40th floor, they can literally be the same size. But if you think about the amount of water pressure that you must be putting on the first floor compared to the 40th floor, mm -hmm. That's a lot of water. Yeah. It's like diving into a pool and the one foot level is very different from the 15 foot level and oh, yeah. you can hear your ears pop. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some common sense type of intuitive uh, knowledge about engineering and uh, physics and the math that goes behind it to make the right decisions. Right. This is why it's so important for engineering students to learn and to, to have good solid backgrounds in mm -hmm. mathematics and physics because mm -hmm. these become sort of the tools they use, the processes that they can employ to, to think about how they're going to go about solving a problem. Mm -hmm. Is, is that uh, a reasonable approach to the problem? Is mm -hmm. it likely to yield a sensible solution? Mm -hmm. uh, can I rely on that solution? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, yes. It's, uh, so that's, that's the, the thing that really is interesting to me uh, about this is this, this now shift towards explicitly talking about engineering pre-college now, mm. which when, at least when I went to school and I spent when you went to school, really uh, nobody did that. I mean, it was very, very rare to have, have any high school, much less a middle school mm -hmm. curriculum on engineering. And now there are actually elementary level engineering curricula, you know? Yes, there are. Uh, I think part of it is because um, uh, information age has made everything go by so fast. Mm -hmm. um, students, in my opinion, if you talk to some of the younger kids, are really intelligent. I mean, there are highly intelligent young, young people out there. And sometimes I think they may not be exposed to all the things that we were. Uh, you know, when you have very little to do at home, I can't play computer games or video games, you tend to go outside and get a ball and play sports and you figure out how to do things the old-fashioned way, build tree houses, stuff like right. that. Um, I don't think those kids now have a lot of those opportunities. And also, because the competition has become so high in majority of the, uh, of the world, you know, we're a little lucky that we're not as heavily competitive in Hawaii, but think about Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. The competition has to be great, which means the students are under a lot of pressure to perform so much better mm -hmm. on these standardized exams or their school GPAs. Maybe they just don't have the time to go out and expose themselves to these new ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why these like uh, math competitions, robot competitions, science fairs are extremely important in trying to get the students to hone in on their interests. Uh, you know, you know as well as I do that if you find your interest, it's pretty easy to teach that person what to do because they're going to go on their own and sure. dig through books or read through the internet or something. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think that's the goal that we're trying to get. The, so the goal is the same. The methods have changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm just just following the way the times have gone. Yeah, I, I mean there, there are interesting cultural differences here too. Mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, you were speaking of the competitive nature of schooling, and mm -hmm. of course, some countries have even far more competitive systems than we do in the sense that, you, know, you better in, believe in, it. <laughs> in, Ger in Germany, at about grade ten, you're taking mm -hmm. a set of exams that determine That's right. sort of your future. And in Japan, That's right. same thing. Yeah, same kind of these these make or break mm -hmm. life or death mm -hmm. exams. And of course, a fair number of students 
fail those end up. Uh, oh, you, you know, you know I, I, I think people in the United States should understand that we live in one of the most forgiving societies. Like you said, in Germany or in Japan or in Asia, you take that one exam and your life is dictated by the score you get. Right. If it's high enough, you can be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. If it's not, you can do something else. Yeah, and it could just have been a bad day when you were sick and... Not, that is right. Uh, that is know, right. Uh, stressed out by a home situation. That, that, that is so correct. I mean, um, United States, if you fail a couple classes or don't do as well, you can always go back, make them up, and figure out a way to get that degree in uh, five years or six years. In Europe and Asia, man, you fail a class, you're pretty much out of the program. Yeah, and, and that's, again, I, I think there's more of a trend now among progressive education mm -hmm. types to look at more than just a single, one single mm -hmm. score mm -hmm. and look at a portfolio mm -hmm. of work that a student has produced. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, what, what did they manage to actually create? Did they, what, what did they do outside of school? What mm -hmm. kinds of science clubs did they belong to? What kinds of projects did they do? What kinds of community service uh, activities were mm -hmm. they involved in it? And try to get a little bit more rounded view, which would then fit in with what you were saying earlier about this idea of a engineering as, as a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. you, you want to be able to look more broadly and say, not just <clears throat> this person was able to get an A on every single test they took, but, but to say that they were able to think, you know? You, you know, we give away a lot of awards, and uh, like, as you said, this is Engineers Week, and one of the awards is the uh, Hawaii Council of Engineering Society's Student Engineer of the Year. Uh, I am constantly shocked by the GPAs I see. Uh, these, these kids are coming up with 3.97, 3.98. That means what? That's like one A minus in the, their four-year career there. Right. I mean, that, that's un unthinkable in my right. my book. Right. You look at somebody <clears throat> like uh, Dean Kamen, right? Mm -hmm. Dean Kamen, of course, flunked out of college. Uh, that's right. But he was he was building, too busy building. That's right. Uh, uh, syringe pumps, that's basically. Right. <laughs> that Albert made, Einstein. Made millions of dollars. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and yeah, a brilliant engineer, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 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 you know. I look at engineering really as the application of science and mathematics. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a third component that I believe is extremely important, that's communication. Oh, because a, as good as you can be in the math and the science and the creativity, if you can't explain what you want to do to the person next to right. you, how far is it going to go? Right. That's, I, I used to... Uh, work with uh, nanotechnology mm -hmm. doctoral students at mm -hmm. University of Washington, mm -hmm. I would point out to them, you could develop a time machine, and if it's in your garage and you haven't talked to anybody about it, have you advanced science at all? Really, no, uh, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people actually might have those time machines in the garage, we just don't know about it. <laughs> well, but then they're not, not really pushing us ahead, you know. No, uh, they're not pushing right. that envelope. Right. Uh, and I think we're in that era where uh, information is not about where do we get it? It's how quickly can we get it? Yeah, how quickly can we use it? That, and how yeah. quickly can we use it and implement it? And you see that all around us anyway. And exactly. And we're, we're going to pursue that thought when we come back, but we're going to take another break right now. Sounds good. Song Joy, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. We'll be right back. Uh, my name is Carl Campagna. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us. 
every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. And we're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is Song Choi, Assistant Dean for the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. We're talking about engineering, because it's National Engineers Week, and we're talking explicitly about engineering education. Mm -hmm. Before we go back to education, though, I had run into a fascinating little article, a little study that was done, which was talking about the sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And basically, students were asked to smell these t-shirts that had been worn for lengths of time by other people and, and judge how pleasant or unpleasant the smell was. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the bottom line in this, which, and it's a, there's a whole fascinating set of studies, of course, around this, but this one was that if you believe that t-shirt was from some outgroup person, mm -hmm. from, for instance, a student at another university, <laughs> you, you found that smell less, less attractive and, and, and more <laughs> offensive, basically, than if you believe that was from a student at your own university. <laughs> so there was a very strong sort of affective component really? to, to, to your sense of smell. Huh? Wow. Which, and, and you were just saying there on the break that, that, that you want, wanted to uh, get into this affective part of engineering, right? The motion in engineering. Well, well, well so that's actually interesting because uh, just Monday and Tuesday, I have a collaboration with Chuo University. Okay. And we were talking about affective engineering, oh, affective robotics. Okay. And, 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 yeah, okay. and part of that in Japan is like Kansai. Okay. So we were talking about recognizing and defining and understanding emotions based on facial gestures, oh, okay. uh, the, the, the frowning of the eyes, the smiling of the, uh, of the mouth. And when you bring this up about the smell, I mean, I don't know, to me, whether it's from my team or the other team, offensive smell is offensive <laughs> smell, but... Uh, apparently not. <laughs> apparently not. I, I guess, you know, they've always said the mind has a, a strong will that can change anything. Right. So. Um, yeah, and, and this area is a huge research area where people are trying to recognize more on how people react to comments and situations, right. which is really and, great. And uh, indeed, uh, in the field of robotics, mm -hmm. as you build actually robots that really do interact with individuals, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. that robot looks like mm, yes, really yeah. shapes how people interact with yeah, it, right? Of, of and, course. And they can make robots that look more human, and particularly if they have a bigger yeah, eyes. That's and, right. And all become friendlier, mm -hmm. sort of, and people react better to them in a, in a more humanistic fashion, if I understand things. Oh, yeah, oh, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, they, they realize that when they create robots that have human features, the interaction is much more in depth. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they have robots that are colder, machine like, the reactions are very, you know, the answers are very curt and short and uh, very right to the point yes, mm -hmm. no. I don't know. I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, and I think it's similar to many people that have used a telephone to do their banking. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they realize it, but when you get on that bank and you talk to that machine and give them your information, that is talking to a robot because they're replying or giving you answers to questions and replies that you give. Right. And, and I'm sure, uh, like your GPS system, the first thing it asks is, please select the voice. <laughs> So obviously, it's looking for a voice that you are more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, that, that psychological, that mental aspect comes into play, that, that affective engineering. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, the, the, there is all kinds of interesting stuff, too. Now, I notice it's because I use Skype a good deal when, mm -hmm. I'm, when mm -hmm. I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And if the video is not, if we're not able to use video because of limited bandwidth, it makes a tremendous difference in, in Skype. It becomes this yes, rather, it is. Yes, it's it rather is. like a, a bad, bad phone call. That's but, right. But, but if you can Skype, I mean, you can see the person, you can That's see right. their expression, you can, you know, you can oh. interact with them on a much better level. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a much closer right. uh, tie. And, and I think that's, you know, and we've become so used to it. Uh, I mean, if you think 10 years back, mm -hmm. God, what, 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 how many places had really wide bandwidth uh, where you can connect up and go do video conferencing. Right. right. Very few. But now, actually, when I, when I was just uh, out in Micronesia last mm -hmm. week, I was able to Skype with one of my parrots. And, and oh, wow. This bird will actually interact with me pretty normally when I'm on, on Skype with it. When it sees, she wow. sees me there, I can give her commands, and she will whistle or tell mm -hmm. us her name or do, mm -hmm. do, do her normal responses. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean the... I, I, I think people have uh, slight misconceptions about technology, too. Mm -hmm. You know, technology is created for anyone to use. Mm -hmm. Technology is not limited to somebody that understands science, math, or engineering. Mm -hmm. If it was, 
all the technology companies would be out of business. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually believe about good 60% of the population don't care about this STEM stuff, but they want to use that cell phone or use their computer or operate their TV, and you have it simple enough that it can be done without going through mathematical equation thinking. Mm -hmm. so, so I've always looked at this um, engineering education as uh, like a three-stem uh, stool where the, the three legs are mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, science, mm -hmm. and the third one would be something in the area of arts, which includes languages and all this other stuff. And then the STEM is the engineering part mm -hmm. because that is the application of those three items. Mm -hmm. And then the little seat on top, that is technology. Mm -hmm. That is the interface that you have to human beings. And if you make that seat mm -hmm. more attractive, more people will use it. Right, right. And it, it's like a flower. It's like mm -hmm. a nice flower with the stem and the the roots which happen to be science engineering arts english whatever some sort of communication aspect but and if you think about the way even a plant grows that's pretty similar you need that strong root mm -hmm. and you need that strong stem mm -hmm. so you can apply to create that flower but the flower guess what okay. it dies and comes back mm -hmm. which means Robotics might be the flavor of this year, mm -hmm. may not be the flavor next year. Mm -hmm. Maybe something completely new. Mm -hmm. Who knows what we're going to have that attracts young kids to come and explore in this area of STEM, if you want to call it. Right. So, and that gets us into this idea, in, you know, like your fab lab of, of mm -hmm. kids getting into these spaces mm -hmm. and, and making stuff. Mm -hmm. And lots of them now do. They make robots of various sorts to do that, various that's right. things. That's right. Uh, for these, uh, and we spoke of the, the science competitions and science fairs where mm -hmm. you're actually told to make a robot that, you know, can lift up a tennis ball and mm -hmm. put, it, put it in a little basket and knock over other robots who are trying to do the same thing or whatever it may be. 100%. But the, the trick, it seems to me, that the, the, the next iteration should be making, you know, asking kids to make robots that do really useful tasks. Yes, so, yes. So robots, for instance, that can go into your water and start taking readings of temperature in the water or yes. salinity in the mm -hmm. water or turbidity in the water. And if you could start getting millions of these robots out, mm -hmm. you, you'd begin to get great data sets yeah. and, and be able to talk about more meaningfully about changes in the ocean. That, that, that's 100% yeah. correct. Yeah. So, so the, the research I did was underwater robots, uh -huh. and we did exactly what you're talking about. Not only were we trying to interact with the uh, environment, but we had sensors that was reading the differentiations in the salinity, the temperatures, and we're trying to find why certain fish were migrating to different areas because of those uh, changes. Uh, but you know, going back to this thing about the iLab and the Fab Lab, the iLab is really an innovation lab, and we want that to be the central point, and it's open to all the students. In fact, the iLab is in Building 37, which is next to Campus Center, which is next, next to the Fashion Institute, which is next to the Art Building. Hmm. It is far away from engineering, business, or law. Huh. But a lot of the people that are in there are multi-disciplined hmm. students. And that area has very limited equipment. We don't want people to get hurt, hmm. so we have a 3D visualization stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like very similar to a holodeck on, on the Enterprise. And then we have 3D scanners mm -hmm. because people now, you know, why go get measurements for clothes when you can mm -hmm. stand up and they can take measurements and then send it to a 3D printer right. and they can just print out your clothes, right. which is nothing more than a replicator, right? right. From a Star Trek. Right. So we're trying to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted to become more specific or more sophisticated with their uh, prototype, they can go to some place like the Fab Lab, which has more uh, I don't know, intimate equipment, more uh, uh, detailed equipment. But of course, that requires additional training. Sure, that's and we want idea. that safety to be number one. Oh, absolutely. But yeah, yeah, as you said, we want them to be able to fabricate, make, right. produce something. Yeah, that's a, a big thing these days. And particularly a big push now from the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. science education mm -hmm. and engineering for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And uh, I deal with this in my work out in the islands all mm -hmm. the time. We want these islands to 
be more self-sustaining to the people on them because they are by their nature very isolated. Mm -hmm. So we're we're setting up a, a sort of a, a fab lab, if you will, mm -hmm. at Majuro. Although it's, it doesn't have fancy 3D printers, it's got things like chop saws and, that, and, that's and what you need. sheet metal benders and things. That, so that, th that's what you need. Yeah, because that's those are the appropriate tools for their for their needs right now mm -hmm. to build solar ovens or dehydrators mm -hmm. or greenhouses or, mm -hmm. or what what you know. Whatever. You know, I'm almost curious if we took a student that grew up in a city and dropped them off in an island. I wonder mm -hmm. if they can survive. Cause I wonder how many people have actually used a knife right. or a saw or a hammer. Right. Uh, so the, the interesting concept. <laughs> what's what's the what's your old saying about uh, if the if the Aborigines designed the IQ test, most of Western civilization would presumably flunk? No, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to do if I was dropped uh, out in the middle of the Australian <laughs> desert. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean. So, so these uh, fabrication aspect, I think, is really important because uh, the way I look at it, we were given five senses as as, as a human being and. Mm -hmm. As a, as a little toddler, you use all the senses to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's why so many kids stick their fingers in their mouth, sure. try to taste and see what it's like. And then, you know, you get hurt because you put your hands on hot things, cold mm -hmm. things. But as we progress that, down that chain, when we start going to school, we only use our, our vision, our hearing, right. and that's it. Right. And so, so there must be a reason why we do that. Right. So, but again, different people are trained for different things. So if, That's you, right. if you are a sommelier, you, you use your sense of smell. Like oh, of course, of course. Fine, fine. Of it, course. It, it is amazing. So what would you say if you had to give quick advice to aspiring engineers, young students who are thinking about going into engineering, what would you say to them? Explore. Explore, okay. I, I would say that would be the most important word. Uh, explore would be the most important word. Uh, don't limit your curiosity. Um, have uh, persistence and dedication, and 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 try things. You, you have to try something. If you don't try anything, you're never going to get anywhere. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But but the fundamentals, the foundations, such as the sciences and the math and the languages, are very important because without those, you can't go do anything. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, this, is, this has been great. I've so much enjoyed talking with you. I feel like I, I've learned a bunch, and I, I hope we've supported National Engineers Week in some, in some small way. Oh, in many different ways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course, I look forward to seeing uh, your iLab and, and Fab Lab. Oh, please, yes, please, please. Please come on by anytime you want. And to anybody out there, if they're interested in the iLab, there is actually a website. It is ilab.hawaii.edu. You can go there. You can look at what's being done, what equipment's there, and even look at the schedules. Cool. I hope many of our viewers will take you up on that one. I hope so, too. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Aloha. And we hope you'll come back next week.